In our previous lecture, we studied the miracles of the resurrection of Christ. And now we're going to look at the women, the events that transpired that Sunday morning. The woman had stood by the cross of Christ. And that stood there, weeping, all broken up. And now they waited and watched for the sun on that Sabbath to go down. Because there was work to be done. You don't work on a Sabbath, by the way. It's God's holy day. On the first day of the week, very early, before sunrise, they made their way to the tomb. What did they take with them? Precious spices to anoint the Savior's body. Rested on the Sabbath. Now they were going to do a last work of honor, anointing the Savior's body. I think this, this was something. Can you imagine them thinking how they would, that precious body that did so much for them, they're going to uh, anoint that body wasn't necessary. Which of these women lived at Bethany? Only one, Mary Magdalene. Now they did not think about his rising from the dead. Sometimes we are so, so dumb, stupid. The sun of their hope had set and night had settled down on their hearts. As they walked, they spoke of the miracles and comforting words of Jesus. But there was one important promise that Jesus made which they forgot. You know, there are almost 5,000 promises in the Bible. Have you memorized one or two of them? John 16 verse 22, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. This is a beautiful passage. Now you have sorrow, and I have sorrow. But Christ is going to change this negative emotion from sorrow to joy. I'm looking forward to that very special day. Why is it so important to remember God's promises? They are so precious. They are promised to losers like you and me. It gives us glorious energy. It gives us a hope. Ignorant of what was even then taking place, they drew near to the garden. But then something struck them. They, they suddenly thought of something. You know, sometimes we don't think before we act. Mark 16, verse 2 and 3. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. As the sun rose, they walked into the garden. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? You know, girls, we never thought of that huge stone. Here we've come. Who's going to roll away the stone? Have you got questions? You've got something to do, but there's a stone barring you from it. Carry on. God will take care of the stone and you'll be able to do your job. They knew that they could not remove the stone, yet they kept on their way. If you want to do something for Christ or some, something for somebody you love and suddenly you realize, but you cannot do it, just carry on. God removes the stones and you'll be able to do what you and he wants you to do. There are times when we feel the urge to do something for the Lord just to realize that we cannot do it. Please, go ahead. And though the heavens were suddenly alight with glory that came from the rising sun. No, not from the rising sun, from a different direction. The earth trembled 
they saw that the great stone was rolled away. The grave was empty. They came with these expensive ointments. <clears throat> the women had not all come to the tomb from the same direction. They lived in different parts of Jerusalem. Mary Magdalene was the first to reach the place. She was the greatest sinner in the life of Christ and the community. And upon seeing that the stone was removed, she realized something has happened. So she hurried away to tell the disciples, Christ rose from the tomb. The most wicked woman proclaimed the most beautiful message. Christ is resurrected. You know, when God forgives you, he allows you to proclaim his glory. And he regards you as if you had never sinned. This is the gospel. You can own this concept. <coughs> In the meantime, the other women came to the tomb. And when they came there, they saw a light shining about the tomb. But the body of Jesus was not there. Only the light. As they lingered about the place, suddenly they saw that they were not alone. If God could open our eyes at this moment, you'll see your guardian angel, two of them, watching over you. This is what happened here. Why do you think, who do you think was at the tomb? A young man clothed in shining garments was sitting by the tomb. It was the angel who had rolled away the stone. Gabriel had taken the form of humanity that he might not scare these dear friends of Jesus because when he first appeared, the soldiers was falling prostrate on the ground. They were terrified. But now Gabriel took on the form of a human being. Yet about him the light of heavenly glory was still shining and the women were afraid. He couldn't remove all his glory. Mark 16 verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away for it was very, very large. A few tons. But to Gabriel this was nothing. He just touched it like this. So they didn't have to remove a stone. Mark 16 verse 5. And entering the tomb, can you see them entering this specific tomb? According to some researchers, they saw a young man. Angels are not old like me. They are thousands and thousands of years old, but they still look young. In heaven we'll not grow old clothed in a long white robe, sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. Now, if you look at this tomb, he couldn't sit on the left side. There was only room at the right side. So this tomb satisfies me that this was the tomb of Christ. Mark 1 verse, Mark 16 verse 6 and 7. But he said to them, so this angel could speak, Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever they talked, do not be alarmed. He saw they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed. And the angel is telling us to don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, ladies, he has risen. He is not here. He's not here. You will not find him here. See the place where they laid him. And the angel showed them the place where he was laid. And then he says, but go tell his disciples, and then just something in parenthesis, and Peter, the disciples and Peter, that he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him as he said to you. Verse 8, so they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. And they trembled and were amazed. We're going to see this on the History Channel. 
and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. You know, sometimes we don't know how to handle good news. Let us ask Matthew to give us his version of the events. They turned to flee, but the angel's words prevented them to do so. Matthew 28 verse 5. But the angel answered them and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. If you seek Jesus, you don't have to be afraid. Matthew 28 verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Now when you walk into the garden tomb to see the place where Christ was buried, and you turn around and walk out of the tomb, those of you that, that have been there, this is what you read on the door. He is not here, for he is risen. Beautiful words. We serve a living God. You don't have to visit his tomb. His tomb is empty. Matthew 28 verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. I have told you. They've forgotten about this wonderful promise. Again they looked into the tomb and again they hear the wonderful news. Luke mentions another angel in human form who says, 24 verse 5 and 6, Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. But is risen, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. So the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, gives us info, as well as the gospel of John. All four gospels. And we're going to do a lecture just to look at the chronology of what happened in sequence. <clears throat> Verse 7, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. He is risen. They shout, He is risen. The woman repeat the words again and again. No need now for anointing spices. I hope they could have given it back to the shop where they bought it. Matthew 28 verse 8. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. <laughs> Can you see women running? That's so funny. But the news gave them energy and speed. When you realize that he is a living God, you will run to tell the good news by the way you live. What a day to remember. He still longs to be resurrected, my friend, from the tombs of our disappointed hopes. He's a God of resurrection. If your dreams have died, your noble dreams, he can resurrect it. He can give you a resurrection of new hope. If you are full of guilt feelings, he can resurrect Feelings of peace. Feeling, feelings of the joy of forgiveness. Mary had not heard the good news. She went to Peter and John with a sorrowful message. John 20 verse 2. They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. She was a very emotional woman. And we do not, and we do not know where they've laid him. Gentlemen, this is the bad news. He's gone. They've taken him away. Sometimes we think that people have taken away the Lord from us. Nobody can take him away from you. No disappointment, no enemies. He's there. 
appreciate it. The disciples hurried to the tomb. And they found it as Mary had said. Said, now we have three people running back. <laughs> Mary running back and the two others for the first time. They saw the grave clothes, but they did not find the Lord. And you can read the gospel. I'm not going to read you all the verses, but uh, they stopped at the tomb and Peter ran in first. John didn't go inside. How did Jesus handle the death clothes, which must been quite an amount of linen. They covered him with expensive linen. How would you handle such many meters of clothes when you arose? They were not thrown heedlessly aside. Men, you know, sometimes we've got a problem throwing our clothes aside. <laughs> but carefully folded each in a place by itself. <laughs> I like this. You know, he could have gone out and enjoyed the singing of the angels outside. But he took a simple little job and he'd do it first. There's no job that's too humiliating. Can you see him there in the tomb first folding up the grave clothes? What an example. Please, follow his example. Whenever I visit here, and this is about every year, I've been here about 40 times now, I think of the neat way in which Jesus handled the small issues of life. By the way, there are no small issues of life. There are only great responsibilities, doing little jobs. It was Christ himself who had placed those grave clothes which, with such care, and the disciples saw it. When the mighty angel came down to the tomb, he was joined by another. So Gabriel had a companion who had been keeping guard over the Lord's body. So since he was taken from the cross, one angel came with him to the tomb. And he was right there in the tomb, taking care of the corpse, the body of Jesus. As the angel from heaven rolled away the stone, the other entered the tomb and then bound the wrappings from the body of Jesus. So this was Jesus' first encounter with an angel who took off the wrappings. I wonder what they talked but it was the Saviour's hand that folded each and laid it in its place. He didn't tell the angel, listen man, see to it. No. Sometimes we must not delegate, but do the job. In his sight, who guides are like the star and the atom, there is nothing unimportant. Work is noble. You've got, if you've got a simple little job, do it with nobility. Order and perfection are seen in all his work. Mary had followed John and Peter to the tomb. When they returned to Jerusalem, she remained behind. Loretta says, as she looked into the empty tomb, grief filled her heart. I think she loved him more than anybody else in those days. She was forgiven most. John 20 verse 11 and 12. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. As, and she saw two angels in white, in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. I'm so glad she looked into the tomb. She saw two angels. A reaction? Verse 13. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? 
She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord. And she carries on weeping. And I do not know where they have laid him. Can you understand, gentlemen, why I'm crying? He's gone. Who took him? Then she turned away, even from the angels, thinking that she must find someone who could tell her what had been done with the body of Jesus. She inquired. Verse 14, Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. You know, sometimes he is there in the needs of people. Do you see him there? Verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Like the angels. The question was repeated. Whom are you seeking? I, I noticed that you, you're seeking something. What was her reply? Through her tear-dimmed eyes, Mary saw the form of a man and thinking that it was the gardener, she said, Sir, verse 15, if you had carried him away, you're the gardener. Tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. That's all I want to do. If this rich man's tomb was thought too honorable, a burial place for Jesus, she herself would provide a place for him. I like Mary. <laughs> she is a go-getter. There was a grave that Christ's own voice had made vacant. The grave where Lazarus, her brother, had lain. She was thinking of putting him in this specific tomb. Might she not there find a burial place for the Lord? She felt that to care for his precious crucified body would be a great consolation to her in her grief. You know, this is human. But now, I think this was tremendous. In his own familiar voice, Jesus said to her, Mary, you know, when, when I read this, I thought maybe in heaven, Christ is going to pronounce our names in a special way. This is what happened to Mary. Now she knew that it was not a stranger. Can you imagine her emotions? Who was addressing her? And turning, she saw before her, before her eyes the living Christ. In her joy, she forgot that he had been crucified, rushing toward him as if to embrace his feet. She said, Rabuni. Rabuni. Maybe she repeated it a, quite a few times. John 20, verse 16 and 17. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary, I, I think at the resurrection, this is just speculation, he's going to call your name. I think so. She turned and said to him, Rabuni, which is to say, teacher, didaskolos, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. You know, this, this is something he first wanted to give her the, assur the assurance that he arose from the tomb. He, he could have gone up and enjoyed the adoration of billions of angels. But he stayed behind to comfort a broken-hearted sinner. I love the Lord. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and to your God. Mary, this is the message. Mary, you are the first person. Remember, you are not the most saintly woman, but you are forgiven. I want you to be the first to bring my personal message 
to the disciples. Now, why did Jesus have to go to his father? You know, when you read the Bible, ask the Bible questions. It has answers for you. While the Savior was in God's presence receiving gifts for his church, the disciples thought upon the empty tomb and mourned and wept. By the way, Jesus went to his father to get approval. He came back that same Sunday. The day that, that day was a day of rejoicing to all heaven. But that day was to, this, to the disciples a day of uncertainty, confusion and perplexity. You know, sometimes when we should rejoice, we weep. What a lesson. What a lesson. The news of Christ's resurrection was so different from what they had anticipated that they could not believe it. You know, they, they anticipated and they, they had dreams of him becoming a ruler, earthly ruler, to rid them of the Roman yoke. Don't have a wrong messianic expectation. He's a humble, kind friend. It was too good to be true, she thought. It was too good to be true, they thought. How did Jacob react when his sons told him that Joseph was alive in Alpharas, the capital in Goshen, Wadi Tumalat, and is the co-ruler in Egypt? How did the old man react? He couldn't believe it. The news was too good to believe. How do you react when good news come to you? How do you react? I don't know if you <coughs> get on your phone SMSs. You've just won two million dollars. Please collect your money for 50 million dollars at the United Nations or wherever. That's bad news. <laughs> so take the little you have. But there are other good news. The resurrection of Jesus. They had heard so much of the doctrines and the so-called scientific theories of the Sadducees. They didn't believe in a resurrection. That the impression made on their minds in regard to the, re to the resurrection was vague. Are you theologically confused? Read what the Bible says, not the theologians. Are you theologically confused? You don't have to. Just take the simple word of God. Read it and believe it as it's written. They scarcely knew what the resurrection from the dead could mean. Theorizing. Sometimes we just have to believe. Mark 16, 7. But go. Tell his disciples. And that coward of a Peter. That he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. These angels had been with Christ as guardian angels throughout his life on earth. They remembered his words, and now they wanted the disciples to believe it. They had witnessed his trial and crucifixion. To think that these angels were at the cross. They had heard his words to his disciples. This was shown by their message to the disciples and should have convinced them of its truth. Sometimes we want to have a feeling. You have to believe what the word says. Believe Christ. Such words could have come only from the messengers of their risen Lord. Tell his disciples. And Peter, the angel said, Why? Now, since the death of Christ, Peter had been bowed down with remorse. If this has happened to you and me, I, I think we would have felt the same, maybe even worse. His shameful denial of the Lord and the Savior's look of love and anguish were ever before poor old Peter. He couldn't erase the eyes of the 
at the palace of Caiaphas when Christ looked at him with love and tenderness. Can you see what's happening in, in this sculpture? It's the story of Peter. This is erected in the, the church of uh, Galigantu in Jerusalem. Of all the disciples, he had suffered most bitterly. To him the assurance is given that his repentance is accepted and his sin is forgiven. Tell the disciples and Peter, and you can put your name in there if you feel you're a wicked sinner. He specializes in great sinners. He's mentioned by name, and God mentions your name and my name by name. All the disciples had forsaken Jesus, and the call to meet him again includes them all. Have you forsaken him? The call is for you to come and meet him again. He has not cast them off. When Mary Magdalene told them that she had seen the Lord, she repeated the call to meeting to the meeting in Galilee. Can you remember the meaning of Galilee? Galilee is a circle. And God wanted to meet them in the circle of his forgiveness. And he wants you and me to meet him in the circle of his forgiveness. A circle has not got no beginning and no end. His forgiveness is endless. How many times has Jesus thus far sent messages through the woman to the disciples? Guess how many times? After preventing Mary to touch him, he ascended to the Father to get approval, to allow people to touch him, and then he descended again. For a third time, he sent a message to his disciples through the woman telling them, that he was resurrected. <laughs> I can't believe it. Three times they were told he has been resurrected. They couldn't believe it. And you know, maybe you've got doubts and I've got doubts. He wants us to believe him that he has been resurrected. And he wants to save us. Matthew 28, 9 and 10. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. He met the woman, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet. Mary couldn't do it, but they went up, and now they could touch him. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. What a saviour. The third time. First it was the angels that told them to tell the disciples Jesus was resurrected and now Jesus himself says to the other ladies, please go and tell them I've been resurrected. I want to meet them at, at Galilee. And we're going to look at the sequence again. What was Christ's first work on earth after his resurrection? There was a purpose in everything he did. To convince his disciples of his undiminished love and tender regard and compassion for them. To give them proof that he was their living saviour, that he had broken the fetters of the tomb. He wanted them to hear this and could no longer be held by the enemy of death to reveal that he had the same heart of love as when he was with them as their beloved teacher. He is not a God that changes. He appeared to them again and again and again. He would draw the bonds of love still closer around him and then, go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, the circle of my forgiveness, and there they will see me. If you want to see God, go to Galilee, 
Go to the circle of his forgiveness and enjoy the gift of forgiveness. As they heard about this Galilee of appointment, so definitely given, the disciples began to think of Christ's words to them, foretelling his resurrection. Slowly it dawns upon their dull minds to reveal that he had the same heart of love when he was with them as their teacher, their beloved teacher. He appeared to them. And we're going to look at this again and again and again. And my friend is going to appear to you and to you again and again to try and convince you that he loves you, that he wants you to break with your sins and enjoy divine forgiveness. As they heard of this Galilee appointment so definitely given, the disciples began to think of Christ's words to them for telling his resurrection. We've got to believe the word of God. If we do, it changes our attitude. But even now they did not rejoice. They could not cast off their doubt and perplexity. Is this your problem? Even when the woman declared that they had seen the Lord, the disciples would not believe. Listen, Mary, listen, ladies. Uh, we're not convinced. They thought them under an illusion. Have you got the same problem that disciples had? Trouble seemed crowding upon trouble. On the sixth day of the week, they had seen their master die on Calvary. On the first day of the next week, they found themselves deprived of his body. Problems upon problems. And they were accused of having stolen it away for the sake of deceiving the people. They despaired of ever correcting the false impressions that were gaining ground against them. Sometimes we despair while we can enjoy good news. They feared the enemy of the priests and the wrath of the people instead of rejoicing in the resurrection truth. They longed for the presence of Jesus who had helped them in every perplexity. Are you longing for Jesus? He will answer your longings. Often they repeated the words, Luke 24, verse 21. Please don't miss the next lecture. We're going to Emmaus. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. But he died. Lonely and sick at heart, they remembered his words. Verse 31. For if they do these things in the green, green wood, what will be done in the dry? Christ the green, they the dry. They said to themselves, we are going to be destroyed. This is the upper room where Christ met with his disciples. They met together in the upper room chamber and closed and fastened the doors. They put on all the locks they could get, knowing that the fate of their beloved teacher might at any time be theirs. And all the time, they might have been rejoicing in the knowledge of risen Savior. He is not here, says the garden tomb, for he is risen. What about us? You know, when I studied theology, I had to go through some of the liberal scholars. God is dead theology. I worked through that. That's a sick theology. But the theology that says he is risen, that's a health-giving theology. In the garden, Mary had stood weeping when Jesus was close beside her. Her eyes were so blinded by tears that she did not discern him. Is, is this your problem? Is it mine? And the hearts of the disciples were so full of grief that they did not believe the angel's messages. 
the messages from the woman or the words of Christ himself? How many are still doing what these disciples did? Too much tears distort your vision, physically and metaphorically. I once had my little daughter picked up a doll and the doll's face was twisted and she cried when she looked at this doll. And the more she cried, the more distorted this doll looks like, looked like. And you know, the more we cry, the more we look at the negative stuff of life, the more our vision is blurred. How many echo Mary's despairing cry? They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Has somebody taken away your Lord? Don't believe it. He never forsakes the sinner. To how many might the Saviour's words be spoken? Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? These words come to you right now. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? My dear friend, he's close beside you, but our tear-blinded eyes do not discern him. He speaks to us, but we do not understand. Oh, that our bowed heads might be lifted, that our eyes might be opened to behold him, that our ears might listen to his voice, the sweetest sound ever. Matthew 28 verse 7, And go quickly. Christ's heart was crushed because his disciples did not believe it. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Bid them look not to Joseph's new tomb that was closed with a great stone and sealed with a Roman seal. Christ is not there. Look not to the empty sepulchre. More not as those who are helpless and hopeless. He is not here. He is risen. Jesus lives, my friend, and because he lives, we too shall live. From grateful hearts, from lips touched with holy fire, let the glad song ring out. From our sad odds, Christ is risen. He lives to make intercession for us right now. He's never lost a case where people confess their sins. If you have unconfessed sins, confess it. This advocate, Jesus, never loses a case where somebody confessed. Grasp this hope and it will hold the soul like a sure, tried anchor. Believe and you shall see the glory of God. He lives, he lives. Do you know this beautiful song? I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, especially the theologians, some of them, I see his hand of mercy. Have you seen that hand of mercy? I hear his voice of cheer. You're forgiven. And just the time I need him, he's always near. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of, of his appearing will come at last. Rejoice, rejoice. O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. And if you know the chorus, please sing it right now. 
He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You're not alone. He walks with me. And he talks with me. Along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how. I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of Jesus who died for our sins, who was resurrected to apply the benefits of salvation to every sinner who feels his need. Help us not to live as if we do not serve a risen Savior, but as if we serve him, who lives not only in heaven, but also in the sinner's heart. In Jesus' name, amen.